I'm Justin Simeon. Uh, I'm a filmmaker and writer. I made a movie called Dear White People. And then Hi, I convinced Justin. White people. Hi, John. <laughs> I convinced <laughs> white people to give me money to make it into a series. And, you know, I really wouldn't have been able to do that without uh, the folks that are here right now, which is the Dear White People Writers Room. Uh, these are the folks directly responsible for our current Emmy eligible season three. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to introduce them one at a time. We have Injeri Brown, everybody. Hi. Am I supposed to say something other than hi? I don't know. Maybe like, what's your like horoscope? I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'm a Capricorn. Capricorn. Rising, that's... resting, whatever it is. Ooh, Hard Capricorn. I like resting. Uh, <laughs> we also have Chuck Hayward, who is the king of the dirty joke in the room. <laughs> That is correct. Hello, Facts. everybody. I'll try to keep it as clean as possible, but I just got back oh, from wine oh. country, so I've got a residual buzz going. Yeah, people need the dirt, so keep it okay. up. Uh, All right. Jack Moore is also in the house. Hi, everybody. Hi, Jack. <laughs> I forgot how to talk for a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also have Mr. Stephen Kung, who graduated from writer's assistant to staff writer last season. Oh. Stephen! And represented by um, a faceless black square. Uh, <laughs> because the internet sucks, we don't know why. Uh, but it's, it is the amazing Nastra Dubai. Uh, you're like a, you're an EP, so I yeah. don't know. You're, I, you're, I, 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 I wish you could you. see me. I wish you could see me because I got my hair done for this, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Persian lives matter, Nastrin. Yeah. <laughs> well, Nastrin is, a, is an amazingly beautiful woman, I might add. Not that that has anything to do with anything. That's not important. <laughs> not important, but she is very beautiful. Sure. And she's also uh, brilliant and um, is, is like the resonant troll. So she will have a lot of both positive <laughs> and negative things to say if she's in character today. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> But this is, these are the voices that um, come together to write the show. Um, you know, I, I think let's start our conversation about what we came in with, uh, you know, what our job was on season three. Uh, and I think we have a little clip to show just to kind of set that up. Uh, so let's roll that clip, y'all. So the show's gonna be a little different with your girl. We're going to touch the major issues, both political and pop cultural. I'll have guests who know all about the Supreme Court and guests who think the Supreme Court is a Diana Ross themed drag race challenge. Yo, can y'all talk? But all my future plans will have to wait. People listening to this live radio broadcast. So here's some soul while I figure out what the hell Al wants. My bad. Uh, hey, could you guys just sign my petition? I'm trying yeah, to- I got it. you, my nigga. J squiggle, B squiggle, right? Yeah, but I get the S at the end a little You guys flourish. are gonna read it? We're signing it, aren't we? Is this some Black Mirror shit? Is my brain stuck in a computer trying to learn a lesson you guys used to care? Hashtag self-care. Everybody's acting so different from the traits they previously established. Ow. Whoa. <laughs> people still care, my dude, but people change, okay? If everyone stayed exactly the same, life would be tedious and predictable like a third season of a Netflix show. Hey. <laughs> I think I began. I think I began our season last season by saying, "Like guys, I figured something out. Shade is not just my love language; it is the love language of this show. Of this show, <laughs> completely. So we begin by <laughs> shading ourselves. What, what were you guys' <laughs> impressions walking into uh, the writers' room? I think we started with a, a beautiful like retreat situation. Um, sure, Yvette Bowser, Bowser, our showrunner, hooked us up in some beautiful location, and we just talked about the series. But you guys, tell me, what was your impression? Well, those two days really helped. Oh, there goes the faceless square. So, <laughs> like, In you, solidarity. It's yeah. okay. You always need like a little, um, like a little palate cleanser and you have like a couple of days to just sort of like get out all the shit so that, you know, and it was, it was a really good way of sort of honing in on what you wanted to say in the third season. And also to just sort of like spew out all the stuff we had been thinking about. You know, um, I, I felt like those two days really helped because we were also like we were kind of like in a in a hotel room together for like two days straight. Yes, and that's that's what rooms. It happened. Yeah. <laughs> 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 to come up with a season that dealt with me too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hotel room with coworkers. We were in different rooms. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself. 
Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, Nostra. No, that was it. That, that was my impression. And I thought it, what, what we came up with, a lot of that stuff was really helpful then when we actually started the season, which we didn't start until, like, I think it was like a month later, or at least like mm -hmm. three weeks later. Yeah. Um, course, that it was really helped to have that. And of course, that's when Justin was, uh, you know, directing yeah. the movie. <laughs> um, right. right. <laughs> which, uh, Bad hair coming to Hulu at some point. Um, yes, so good. Yes, bad hair. Yes, <laughs> but, um, but so having those two days at Terranea, I don't know—is that a free plug? Uh, <laughs> yeah, plug. At some beautiful place um, to kind of talk with Justin about his ideas for the season, things we were talking about. I know, like, we really wanted. There was a lot of talk that we wanted to talk more about. Uh, sort of systems of power, capitalism, um, sexual misconduct was obviously a big theme of the season. So we were, we kind of threw a bunch of topics at the wall and sort of during that weekend started putting together how they would fit in our world. And you know, it was also well, kind of- Sorry, go ahead, Chad. Okay, Also, just as us all the time. It's fine. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. I'm going to talk. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I know Justin was um, pretty clear on, and I think that Terranea was a good setting for it, is this whole idea of like spring awakening. And I know the characters in that clip we just saw, Joel kind of touches on it, or Reggie kind of touches on it when he talks about like people, oh no, Al, when he talks about people having these characteristics. So unlike what we see in season one and two, and it was sort of like, you know, like Justin said, like a spring awakening, everyone's just trying to like get a reboot and do a palate cleanse. Um, but of course they, as the season goes on, we see they're pulled back into these respective struggles that, that Jack alludes to. Yeah, and it wasn't it wasn't just the um, the you know the, the vibe that was different. Was like the way that it was shot was different. The way that we told the stories were different. Because before we did all single protagonist stuff, and everything was very intense. And there was how this one person sort of moves through the world. And then in season three, you see a little bit more of a leisurely pace with the way everything is shot, and people are a little bit more mellow. And I, and we we did multiple protagonists per episode. So I thought all that came together to really like convey that hey, this is a different it's a different thing it's almost like that you know you say the third season of a netflix show it's kind of like the third your junior year of college which is like you're past all the novelty of it and now you're just becoming who you really are you're figuring right. out who you are i think that's such a that that was such like a central theme of that of season three and and like yeah uh, you know content and form sort of like coming together of no more single protagonists you know uh yeah, every uh, the storytelling matching kind of the structure of the story. It was just and smart. Yeah, and also <laughs> you know. that's true. And also rounding out the world, right? Because we got to see the stories of other characters and go into their interior lives, and people love that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, threw, I threw a lot at you guys. I was like, guys, so first off, I'm making a movie right now. <laughs> Step one, gonna be weird. Um, so uh, I'll see you you know, here and there at the beginning and then all the time at the end, but like everything has to be done on time, if not sooner. And then also <laughs> on top of that, I was like, let's totally break the format because for a long time, you know, we get like, this is wonderful, but what about my story? What about my aspect of the black experience? And we wanted to get in those characters' uh, voices from the very beginning. And I certainly felt like at least when we were starting season three, we were sort of, you know, the Me Too movement, I feel like was becoming the civil rights movement of the moment. But we were still in the aftermath of Black Lives Matter and sort of, you know, which is of course the civil rights uh, movement of this moment again, uh, but also dealing with like a lot of uh, black superstars being taken down uh, or, or, or not being taken down by the Me Too movement and like why that, that was translating differently uh, in black culture. Um, I'm going to go to Injeri and Nasty first um, for no reason whatsoever. But I, I was really, um, the way we dealt with the Me Too movement really came, it felt like it came out of an organic set of conversations that we were having in the room, like in real time that we were trying to figure out how to translate 
into the show. What was your experience of that, and Jerry? I, I think of you specifically as, you know, you and Nasty both at, you know, some of the episodes that were very acclaimed for, things like the abortion episode with Coco, uh, you know, her going home, uh, visiting her parents, um, the, the episode with Sam and her father. These are things that like, you guys kind of brought these concepts like urgently, like this is the thing I need to talk about. Just tell me a little bit about that, how that was for you, bringing things up in the room and then turning it into like pop culture. Yeah, I mean, for me, with the whole Me Too of it all, I think that <clears throat> I had an urgency to tell the story, and it was, I think, shared by everyone, but my urgency came from a place of just having these conversations with um, the Black men in my life, and some women, too, because it doesn't always cut along lines of, like, what their sex is, but where there wasn't sort of an accounting for, like you said, our Black leaders who were being accused of these things, like, the Me Too movement was just so... Um, homogenous in that way when we know that you know things happen in our community that people for various reasons just don't want to address and so I guess I was just a little bit frustrated having those conversations with people in my life who you know wanted to make excuses for the behavior or wanted to um, you know point toward like historical events um, surrounding them as a way to like suppress the conversation and what better forum to like bring that to light than like you know television shows where you get your revenge right and so um, <laughs> and so that was that was what was informing my point of view on that mass trend yeah i i mean for for me what i what i liked about w w what you said you wanted to do was not to make it so like this person's good that person's bad you know what i'm saying like there was we were really like, we were gonna sort of like delve into areas that were really uncomfortable and that they weren't going to be just so black and white and it's either right or wrong. Because when I talk to a lot of people that, you know, that I respect, they're like, there is, there, there is really a, a, a line that you walk and I felt like we did that on the show. What I also appreciated about it is that we told the story through a character that wasn't, like at least one of the characters was not one of our main characters, but then she ended up being in like all 10 episodes, which was the Brooke character. I yeah. mean, she was just like right. comic relief um, for, you know, the first two seasons because we were doing, um, you know, like single perspectives. And then once it got, like once we got into the third season, it was like all of a sudden this character is, she's sort of like touching every main person's life. And the way that we got into that, that was like, to me, that was, that was the thing that really got to me. And I was like, oh, this is a l really different way of telling the story, you know, mm -hmm. because it wasn't just, and then it was her. And then it, it sort of affected everybody, even the way it affected Reggie, you know, he finally finds his hero and, you know, the guy is being taken down. So that, that was one thing. And then as far as like what you said about like the personal stories, what I have to say I appreciated about you, Justin, was that you definitely had a vision for the show, but you were also very open to other people's like personal stories. You really mind that, not in a, not in a like, I'm gonna take advantage and take your story and just like, you know, and, and, and throw out anything that was personal to you and like do it my way, but really digging into what like affected us in it and like really honing in on that because like this is season two but like you know I told the story of a loss in my life and you really were like listening I talked like I told you about like the letter my husband left me and you really like listened to that and what I appreciated is that you definitely like did your usual pass and stuff and all that but you also didn't I didn't feel like, oh, I just wasted the story on this show, mm. which I often felt on other shows <laughs> where you share a personal story and then they just take it and it's like, this isn't at all what I was wanted to do or wanted to say. And you didn't do that with that story. And I always say that to everyone. Like, I really appreciate it because it's very personal to me and you didn't like just, you know, upend it. So that's yeah. that. And, and it was true of like many other situations where somebody would have a personal story and you mind it in the right way, you know? Well, I, well, I'll, I appreciate, I'll, I'll I appreciate that. 
to, to piggyback on that even further, Nastrin, like there were, if you don't mind me saying, like there were elements of the letter that your husband left you that, that like we used in the show. Like there no, we used, we literally used the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah which I th which was yeah. very moving even from the cheap seats where I was sitting. Like it, I was, that how that must have felt to see that reflected on screen must have been incredible, so. I mean, what was interesting about that was that I never told my daughter that. And then she watched the season and she got to the, cause you said, just use the letter, use the entire letter. And so she, wa and she's like, like halfway through, she's like, wait, that's daddy's letter. <laughs> like it just, it hit her like halfway through. And then she started crying and you know, it was, it was very, it was very touching. Um, but other people who didn't, you know, know that it was a personal letter also were touched by it. So, you know, it was like, that was a good experience. But also I think generally, like, I know part of this conversation is about our process in the writer's room. And one of the things I want to say is that Dear White People was my second show in Hollywood. I came as a staff writer. I left somewhere like in the producer or co-producer area. And so in my interpretation, like I grew up on that show and I can't stress how important it is to be at that point in your career and be heard in a room and have your opinions valued and have like your words and your, you know, your perspective in a show and have a showrunner and a creator who respect that and who keep that intact because that's how you find your voice, how you become a better writer. That's just, these are formative years, you know, college campus. So there, there's a comparison, but these are formative years. And so, I will say that what Nashron is saying is true just as a whole in the way that, you know, the show was run and the, and the stories were created. Like Justin really respected everyone's contribution. And I'm is, nodding my head vehemently. <laughs> Steven, go. It's also especially important for people of color because we've all been in rooms yeah. where we're the only pers person of color in the room and we'll pitch and we'll pitch on something about race or authenticity or something that we might find cringeworthy or offensive and then we'll be ignored. And it's like, it hurts when that happens. So like to and Jerry's point, yes, it matters when you're at that point in your career where you're developing your skills and you need to feel heard and you need to build that confidence and get better at pitching. And, and we are so lucky to have Justin who, who fostered all these voices. Um, sure. and so yeah, true. and listen to our stories. I'm gonna I'm gonna take that a step further and say that because uh, I'd, I'd worked on I think four shows prior to Dear White People, and they w I was a staff writer every season, and that's not supposed to happen. You're supposed to get promoted <laughs> with each season of television you're on, but it, as as a lot of writers of color find, we get stuck in that staff writer rut because we're free. Um, you know, the studio will pay for us out of their out of their budgets or whatever. Um, and I actually was offered another job at staff writer level to be my fifth time show running it, uh, fifth time uh, staff writing. And Justin said, don't take that show. I don't know when my show is coming, but it's definitely coming. I will hire you as a story editor, which is the next level up. And, and I, I did, I did not, I declined that other job and he was a man of his word. So um, he's walking the walk out there, y'all. Well, look, to me, it's just the obvious thing to do. It's, it's selfish. <laughs> it's like, you know, people are like, what's the secret? What, how does it feel so personal and so universal at the same time? It's like, well, you just hire good people and you like try to facilitate an environment where they can do their best work. To mm -hmm. me, that's like, duh. Um, but I will say Chuck was the first person I called because I knew that like, you know, if Dear White People was going to become a series, like I needed more jokes. Chuck is like one of the f most funniest, but inappropriately, like you can give him, you know, Citizen Kane and that shit will come back with a punch up and will be like, <laughs> hilarious <laughs> and profound, you know. And, and dicks and canes are uh, like, yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Steven a little bit. I'm looking at Chuck because, you know, there's a, and I'm looking at Jack a little bit too, the men, because like, you know, there is a queer sensibility to maleness in the show. Uh, and I think that we make jokes that frankly, like other shows would not, I don't think make. So will you guys talk to me just a little bit about the humor of the show uh, and, and how it relates to the queerness of the room and, and the show itself? This is, this is actually an example from season four, which is not shot yet, but from the yes. season four, um, there was, I would say like a 20 minute debate argument about whether or not uh, Lionel and the person he is hooking up with 
uh, should be doing poppers in a scene. And, <laughs> and what popper etiquette is and what popper. And I, I just remember as we were sitting in the argument being like, you know, I've been on a bunch of shows. I've never been on a show where it was like a very detailed yeah, conversation yeah, yeah. about when and where would Lionel have access to poppers? And if he had them, would he like them? Would he not like them? It was, it's just like, <laughs> It's a very queer lens show, and I, as a queer person, I really appreciate being a part of it, but also just like as a viewer of television, it's really nice to see. We were also talking about whether Lionel was a top or a bottom. We've seen him top before, but it's like, oh, do we, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil anything for you in season four, but uh, we changed we change things up for, I don't know. We go into a <laughs> We discuss it vigorously. Um, I'm not going to spoil it, but I spoiled it. Which I actually think is a really good segue into the next clip. So let's roll yes. it. Well, it all started when I fell hard for this secret alt-right monster. For the hate sex? I get it. All right, but sounds like any sex. And then I met this sweet guy, and we liked all the same things. And he was the first person I we had the intercourse. Yeah, but then he dumped me because I'm monogamous. OK, the air quotes. They're confusing me. Are, are you not monogamous? Oh, no, I am, I think. But when I went back home for spring break. You revenge fucked your way through the locals on Grinder within a 10 mile radius? Yeah, but not quite. I, I mean, I did go a little while back home in Houston, you know, like Houston, but where was Ho? Houston. Mm. Anyway, mm -hmm. now I'm just, I'm nervous, so I'm here. Should we get started? Okay, have you had sex with a woman since your last test? <laughs> How about a man? Yes. Okay, how many partners? Two and a half? Was the man short or? Fellatio is half, right? No. Did you have sex under the influence of methamphetamines, AKA meth, AKA Tina? Who? Cocaine, AKA Yay AKA Yayo, AKA Bolivian marching powder. No. Who's doing? Do people answer yes to these? Alcohol. Oh. Yes. Mm. Lots and lots of that. <laughs> did you use a condom? Once I did. The other guy. Relax, honey. Every day on campus has sat in that chair and has gone through exactly what you're going through right now. And every straight should, but a lot of them are just trashy people. If you get a positive result, would you be a danger to yourself today? I. I don't, I don't know. I kind of need an answer. Let me tell you, one of them requires a lot less paperwork, so. No, I'll, I'll be fine. The incomparable Griffin Matthews, ladies and gentlemen. Griffin that Matthews guy is <laughs> out of control good, man. I'm laughing at that thing like I've never seen it before and like I wasn't in the room when it, when it was being said. Every time. Every Just single time. Long ago. Justin, you're on mute. Unmute myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I watched the show back, and I'm so, so I'm constantly surprised by it because, like, you know, when we're in it, the focus is very narrow, and it's about the deadlines yeah. about getting it done. But you know, really, like, it's so like that scene in particular. I was thinking about all of the lines that we as a room fought over. Like, we fought over trash people. I was thinking we, the same thing. The same. Yeah, <laughs> we fought over like you know which drugs to list. Um, I, let's, talk, let's talk about that, about what happens, you know, on our show where, you know, a writer will bring a scene into the room and, you know, I, I, we're not quite like other comedy shows, but we definitely do like punch ups as a group and we definitely unpack scenes as a group and specifically uh, with intersections, we bring up potential problematic things and, you know, you know, when you're doing a black show, you have to think about all this stuff. Like, what skin tone are the people in this scene? Uh, what political ramifications uh, come from this scene if people take it this way? But what about if they take it that way? And what about this movement? What about, so I just want you guys to maybe talk to, to that. Like, we bring a scene into the room, but it isn't that. It becomes that uh, through our conversation together. Um, well, I, I think, uh, 
I wrote that episode and I, the, the Deontay episode, uh, back and forth. But I, I feel like all I came into the room with, with my pitch was based on, I had a crazy story about going get, to get tested for HIV. And the woman who was doing the rapid test and interviewing me forgot to give me her, the result. So it, acted, <laughs> so it seemed like she, it seemed like the answer was I had HIV. And so she was like doing the due diligent follow-up. So she like looked down and goes, so have you used methamphetamine? And I was just like, oh my God, like usually they just say, oh, you're fine. And then she saw my face minutes and minutes later and was like, oh, did I not say you're okay? <laughs> I was like, missed the headline there. And, but that was like, it started as just that story and being like Lionel being in that position felt like funny and we wanted to introduce this Deontay character. Um, and then I feel like from there, we just talked about all of our weird, like STD phobia when we first started having sex and like your, you know, all that weird shame stuff that we're conditioned to. And then it just sort of built. Yeah, um, and, I, and I also just want to mention really quickly, uh, two things. One, if you uh, have any questions for us, this would be the time to ask them uh, in about, I don't know, I think 10 minutes, I will start asking questions from our lovely audience, so get your questions in now. Uh, and the second thing I just want to bring up is that Deontay was a new character introduced in season three, uh, you know, one of the expanded ensemble that we were talking about. And one of the big reasons was it's because as refreshing and wonderful as it was to step through the world of Winchester from Lionel's singular perspective, um, because he is still like journeying to who he is, that, that meant that we couldn't see what the queer community outside of his point of view looked like at Winchester. And so we wanted to introduce a character that would kind of open up, you know, uh, that conversation because we have so many fans of the show. Nastrin, you made it! <laughs> Nastrin's Nastrin. there! Oh, and her hair looks ooh, look phenomenal. Look at her background, y'all! <laughs> the promise oh of the premise, your hair looks great. Oh, weird. You got a right Okay, go ahead, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> no, okay. look at but, you, um, girl. But you know, the, the the point was really to uh, to open that conversation up and to um, you know bring in more perspectives. Mm -hmm. This is just a little fun fact too about it. You know, a lot, one of the ways we conceived of Deontay, who's uh, uh, based on a friend of Justin's um, from childhood, but one of the ways we conceived of him was thinking of him as sort of Lionel years in the future, kind of like somebody yeah. who was further along in the gay community, less of a baby gay, um, had a lot more experience. And the great irony in all of this is that Griffin Matthews, who plays Deontay, auditioned to play Lionel in the movie, yes. Dear White People, like eight years earlier. Uh, yeah. So it really was this kind of cool full circle thing. Even from the second he auditioned, it was between him and a few people and like right away, we all like looked at each other. We're just like, oh, uh, that guy's a TV star. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and to tie this back into your question about masculinity and like the way we critique it, I think part of the secret sauce for Dear White People is that it's an entirely androphilic room, uh, meaning that everyone in the room likes dick. And uh, it's such a queer That's room. I'm just sorry. <laughs> <laughs> is that a what? I was going to Google that. I love but it. This, is, this, um, this chat is over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what was that word again? <laughs> That's not, that is not true. That's not true. Some of us love it, Steven. Some of us love it. For me, for me, it's everything, and especially with this conversation between, like, you know, Lionel and Deontay, and, like, I feel, feel like historically, well, for some reason, queer people tend to be in a better position to critique masculinity than others, um, just because, I, I don't know, like, I, I've, just because anecdotally, I don't know of any straight men who've, really written about masculinity and what it means to be about it. But because for gay people, masculinity is sort of at a premium and for better or for worse, a lot of us strive towards it. And I think that makes us critical of it and willing to be a little more introspective for these characters and how they deal with it. Yeah, and we've, we've also had to sort of have our own individual journeys with how much masculinity we um, espouse, I guess, or how, how much we allow people to, to perceive from us. Um, and so, you know, a lot of just, I, I think at some point we were all closeted. So masculinity was more than a premium. It was like uh, a survival 
skill tactic. It was a cloak, you know what I mean? So like we are aware of what is performative about masculinity and what is more natural and what is toxic and what is, you know, beneficial, like all those things. It's kind of like there's talk today about, you know, with um, the Black Lives Matter, you know, people are with writers in Hollywood, like black people know our shit and we know white people's shit because we have to live in that world. Gay people know our shit and we know straight shit because we have to live in that world. So it just, it does create more of a, of a 360 view of all these different issues. I feel like. And I'll, I'll say everyone, um, even in the dick centric, Anglo-centric, what's it called? Anglophilic, I believe. Andro. Andro. And philic. Yeah, andro oh. Even in our androphilic room, everyone sort of, you know, represents a different intersection of things. Um, you know, uh, we have queers, we have women, we have bisexuals and homosexuals and all kind of stuff up <laughs> in that room. Um, but one thing, I, I'm going to throw a question out, just switching gears just a little bit. Kind of one more question for all of us, and then we'll start taking some audience questions. What was something, um, I'm going to throw both of these out and anyone can answer. What was something that you fought for and won? And or what was something that you fought for and lost? in the room. Uh, can, can I quickly answer fought for and lost? Yeah. Because it was very, uh, it was one of the biggest fights in Jerry and I ever got into in the room. And- I was gonna answer, go ahead. <laughs> and, and Leanne too, who's not here. Um, but it was about Gabe checking Native oh. American on-, on oh. the we are still fighting about this. That's right. You fought with both of us in that moment. Okay, I go ahead. Both you, and I was totally wrong. Um, <laughs> and uh, but I, what I, basically, I felt like after the events of season two, I felt like it, the character that we reached the end of season two with, after calling the cops and having that fall out, and like having the <clears> big blow up with Sam in the radio station, I didn't buy that Gabe would do it. Um, to me, it felt uh, like. It, I don't know. I just I, I felt like we had like done those beats with him, and um, and I remember we had a huge fight about it uh, where and Jerry and Leanne basically were like, "You're crazy. He definitely would just do it," um, and that's good storytelling and all these things, which was correct. And I remember the thing that happened was like while we were having that fight, the Elizabeth Warren Native American thing came out. It literally happened, yeah. Uh, I'm, and it was this like clarifying moment of just, oh man, not only am I wrong, but like the world is now telling me that I'm wrong. Which is how I just learned to listen to and Jerry more. Because, <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely that's, like and that's good, the moral of the story for everyone on this it re It's not a bad moral, I have to say, to follow nope. just in general. It uh, works for me. <laughs> And I think it's why the show, you know, people talk about the show being prophetic. It's like, you to go back and watch old episodes is basically like watching, you know, the present and possibly the future. It's a little unsettling how we sometimes will speak to moments that haven't even happened yet. But I think it's because, you know, we really have these conversations in, in really full out kind of thoughtful or practical ways of like really unpacking how do these situations come to be? What are the different elements? What are my blind spots that Jerry can see? What are in Jerry's blind spots that Jack can see, et cetera? Uh, you know, until we figure out, feel like we've got something that feels truthful. And unfortunately, odds are a lot of these things end up happening and, and proving us right, although that's never the intention. All right, I'm gonna go to some audience questions because there's a few of them and I think we could uh, talk to them. Um, okay. This is from Tanisha Jackson, who wants to know, uh, determining the arc of the show, uh, by se is that by season or was there an overarching endpoint within view from the inception of the series? I can certainly, I created, I can speak to it, but if anyone else wants to take that, feel free. Yes, you should. All yeah, right. Probably. I mean, <laughs> you know, being at, um, you know, being at a Netflix show, uh, you kind of have to prepare for both cases because we would never know if we were being renewed at the end of a season or not. So, you know, I had an idea of how this would end. Um, to me, this is a story about identity versus self. It's about the fact that every human being that walks this earth has a role to play in society and has a version of themselves to nurture. And that, what do we do when those two things are at odds? And I wanted to explore that from the black point of view in as many ways as possible. But that's what the show was always about for me. And so, um, you know, to me, it was a question, the theme of the show is a question. 
not so much an answer. And that was, you know, one strategy to keep it so that like at the end of each season, there was always more to say and more to ask, but you felt like we had something of a complete conversation because we had to prepare for either way, either instance. Um, it's a little bit different going into our last season where we know it's the end uh, and we feel like, you know, it has to be definitive in some way and have some answers and not just be totally open-ended. Um, but, you know, the goal is always to portray life. Um, anybody else want to add on to that? Well, you, I'm just going to say, like, every season you did come in with, like, what you wanted the theme of the season to be. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was the first season was, was you came in, you like, I wanted to be, you know, uh, you wanted the, the theme to be, you know, identity and self and all of that. And then the second season, like you had a different idea and the third season you had it, but you came in always with the theme and then we built off of that. Mm -hmm. So I would say that you definitely like set that tone for us because it's, it's good to be given like, you know, rain to sort of, um, you know, like be a writer, but it's also good to have somebody who knows what, what their show is. Mm -hmm. right. Because I've worked on many shows where the creator doesn't know what their show is. By the second episode, they're like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> they don't say it like that, but it's that. <laughs> Literally, I can't even imagine what that must feel like. <laughs> I would, I would just feel naked. Here's a really interesting question. This is from Devante Sanders. Um, this is one's kind of for you, Jack, because you wrote this episode. How do you write an episode like chapter eight from season two, where the entire thing is a single conversation or specifically, um, how do you navigate the beats under those constraints and where do you start? And before you begin, I'm gonna say that it's always on our mind as a show, like how would we do a bottle episode? Because they save a lot of money. For those who don't know what that means, a bottle episode is like, you know, these are the, these are the uh, series regulars, these are the sets. We, this is basically all the stuff we pay for anyway. Uh, how do we shoot an episode within the constraints of what we have to pay for without expanding the budget further? Go ahead, Jack. <laughs> um, you know, my background uh, is in playwriting, and so that was definitely part of where that came from. I think also, in that particular instance, uh, Gabe and Sam uh, had a lot to say to each other. And like we were finding just in the breaking of the overall season that they weren't actually in the same place, but they were sort of talking about each other a lot, uh, mm. wherever they were. And so it felt like as we were getting towards the end of the season that putting them in a room together for an extended period of time was going to be kind of necessary. Um, in terms of uh, writing that as a full episode of TV, you just think about it in terms of breaking story like you would if you're breaking story in a regular episode, you know, with plot machinations and stuff, only the, the story beats are conversational beats. So uh, if you watch that episode, there are very clear moments where the tide turns on the conversation and a person who was on the offense goes on the defense uh, or someone or two people go on the kind of comforting uh, go on a comforting uh, tact instead of like, you know, so it's like, it's really, you have to be very clear about what the tactics are and you sort of, uh, the outlining process and the script writing process sort of fold into one thing. Um, you're sort of doing them simultaneously. Uh, you know, I think our outline for that episode was only like six pages as opposed to like, yeah, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and at the time we were like, is, does that mean this isn't going to work? <laughs> um, and, then, and then start writing it and you feel like, oh no, actually there's a lot here. Um, and it also, you end up playing more with silence because you're limiting your palette in some ways. And so leaving moments without dialogue or just looks and things like that end up having a lot more power. Um, and also have someone like Justin direct it. So it looks amazing. I also remember on that episode specifically because Justin has a lot of like movie references, which is which I personally love because you know the the TV thing was a whole side trip for me. Um, <laughs> but but um, he has movie references, so we started to use movie references for things. And I specifically remember with that episode, somebody I think maybe Jack, it was you, it was like the the reference was Nixon Frost, right? <laughs> that's yes, what we that's used great. as the reference so it, it's all it was it wasn't like we're gonna rip it off or anything but it was all it's always good to have like cinematic references 
and and Justin actually, you know, he like in, when we first started, he made us watch a bunch of scenes from different movies just to show mm -hmm. like what he wanted the visuals to be. So yeah. he he always has like you know this whole like cinematic library in his head, and it's good to know what it is, and then you just keep adding to it. And that one is like a Mike Nichols movie. I remember that was something that we talked yes. about. Yes, yeah. like it was like structuring it like a. Uh, Closer. Bob and Carol. Or was it? Yeah, was that, that was Bob, Bob, Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. Bob and Carol, Ted and Alice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, any of the, I mean, it's sort of you know one thing I recognize as a feature guy coming into TV is that like especially with a show like this, it's so written and it's so much about what they say. Uh, the cinema of it, you know, I didn't want to wait until it was time to direct it to figure that stuff out. So I wanted mm -hmm. to, you know, bring in like these are other things that we can figure out in the writers' room. Uh, we can create these moments without words. Uh, and we can sort of like tell really the directors how uh, to approach the material. Um, okay. Can, uh, I'm sorry, can I, can I add one more thing to that? I, sure, one, one thing that I thought was so impressive about that episode was like after, because I wasn't on set during it, so like I was seeing it on, on screen for the first time and I was just like, nobody gives up power, nobody is ever bored, there's such a brilliant choreography and the, I thought the message of it was like, it is so important to just communicate with people and once you get that stuff out in the open, then you can really have an, an honest relationship because the two of them were both posturing and both trying to sort of be, you know, the top dog in that situation. And they were both recording it for their own separate uses right. and they had their slants on it. And so it's like how much of, of, of what our argument is, is posturing and how much of it is us getting legitimate stuff off our chest. And I just thought, I thought it was a really brilliant way to show how, how our communication can be faulty with the people that we love. So I, that's what I, took away from that instead that I thought was so like profound. Well, it was certainly a really fun episode for me. Um, I want to talk about, uh, Brittany Williams has a question for us. Uh, she wants to know, uh, Dear White People often plays with the fourth wall between its characters and the audience. Do these moments come naturally in your writing or are these moments debated when being used? I'm gonna look at Steven, cause Steven's like the low key Dear White People historian. Like, yeah. remember we don't know <laughs> yeah, someone's true. last name or we don't like remember what hall they live in or what happened in episode five and chapter six, whatever. Steven always knows. So I'm gonna look to Steven first for this one. I think the meta jokes actually started with season three. And in that in that clip where like Joelle and, um, uh, with Joelle and Reggie and they're like, it's the third season of a Netflix show. And I feel like once we broke that barrier, talking about the show sort of obliquely, jokingly, we just sort of let, we love that joke so much that whenever we made a meta joke, just like off the fly, Justin would be like, I love it. And we'd all love it too. And like, it, there's just funny jokes and we've got plenty of those in season four too. But yeah, I think it all started with that, season uh, three first episode where we started. Well, we never really planned it. They just came out of the moment, right? Like, I don't even, I don't ever remember like any of those things being in outlines. They were just, they, well, they came out in the writing. Did they? Well, I will say in the first episode, the narrator tells the audience that he's been hired simply to right. explain shit to well, them. That's true. So that's we kind of right. laid a little bit of shade work <laughs> for the future. Uh, meta shades to be added. Those aren't words. Um, someone also just asked in, in the uh, in the chat room, uh, where, you know, there's a moment at the end of episode five, chapter five of volume three, the last season, uh, where Yvette Nicole Brown uh, steals Coco's look to camera because all the characters, you know, since season one have been looking to camera at the end and Coco looks into camera and then, you know, Yvette Nicole Brown who plays her mother is like, what are you looking at? And then we cut the line. <laughs> Someone just wants to know where that came from. And that came out of, uh, we were just on set. I, I yeah. think uh, I think Cheryl, Cheryl Dunye, who directed that episode, uh, Yvette Nicole Brown, like it, it was just like, it came out of a conversation. And I, I remember Cheryl being like, so this came up, but you probably don't want to do it. And I was like, no, we have to do that. Like this yeah. has to happen. So uh, I am, a, I'm a fan of, of the meta thing. It happened actually in the rehearsal of the, yes. of the scene. That's yeah. right, mm -hmm. yeah. that's right. Hardaway, can I just add something? Do we have time for that? So I was looking, I was looking back at that episode um, today, in fact, and you know we all love Coco's story when we originally like you know formulated it. But I think you know Coco comes from that place. Obviously, we know where she's keeping so many secrets about her identity, like so much so that she wants to even hide who her mother is. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, that's sort of like a hard thing to bear witness to like a year ago or however long that episode came out. But I think the time and place that we're in when black people are like, I'm no longer code switching, I'm not fuck respectability politics, and I'm mm-hmm. going to be aggressively myself. The cocoa of it all really resonates even like deeper now. Yeah. And so her mom stealing that fourth wall is sort of like, you know, a manifestation of that. Like, no matter where you try to hide, bitch. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I just, I love that so much. That's, very, That's great. very, very true. And one of the many examples where, like, it wasn't my idea at all. My job in that case was to get out of the way of that, that very good idea. Just because I, I feel like we should say the the non Justin people on the call, uh, this is not like yeah. not normal uh, in TV always to have a showrunner who really will go with a great idea, even if it is not their idea. Mm-hmm. And Justin all like he, not to say he doesn't get stubborn about the things he likes. He does. But, <laughs> but he also is really open to the best idea coming from anywhere. And I feel like that came up time and time again uh, throughout all three. Yeah, seasons. and the other thing is that he is, even if he like, his initial instinct is to say no, because you, you ask, what did you fight for? Here's something that, that we fought for. This happens that all you initially time said no to was Coco going on that road trip with uh-huh. the girl. And you were like, no, I don't see a reason why they would go. And we just like, I just kept coming at you. And <laughs> I came at you and then I came at you. And, and eventually you, you were like, yeah, I guess I could. Like you, you accepted it because, and, and it, like it turned out to be a good thing. Like I, I, I assume you liked it in the end. <laughs> in I the was end. into it. But, but you, even when your initial reaction was like no to something, I felt like you went and considered it when even outside of the room and outside of like the building where we did our job. Because you, I would remember sometimes you come in like two days later and go, you know, I was thinking about that thing and maybe we should do it. And, and that is great. There, there are many times when I walked into rooms like, guys, that thing I vehemently fought against is really a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, there because were, and- the truth is, when I don't like something, it's more so like, these are the problems I have with it. If you can help me solve these problems, yes, that's <laughs> true. Exactly. That is yeah. we can do it, you know. Yeah. And and that, that if, if that Lee uh, Bowser, who was all, who was also our, our showrunner, would like yes. have the same thing. It was like if you can talk me out of it, like she would say, I don't want to do this, um, but I tell here's why I don't want to do it because it scares me. And then that would Justin would be like, well, if it scares us, that's probably the reason that we should right. do it. I can't remember exactly. I, I don't remember if it was the abortion one that that, it was, the that was the one. Yeah, that Where, one. yeah. She, she she was vehemently against it, and then just all of us sort of bringing in our different perspectives, and was we were able to sway her. And I think and, and the same she with loves Justin. The episode. And she loves the episode, and I think yeah. that is great for all the you know um, aspiring showrunners out there. I think that is a great example of leadership, which is like yeah, you know, you can you can. If, if your lieutenants are giving you strong enough reasons why why something should be done or why a story is important to be told, you should listen to them and kind of put whatever your preconceived um, notions are aside sometimes. I think that's awesome. It was the first thing I learned in storytelling is that you want the audience to hope and fear between a binary of two choices, but then you give them something that they never thought of in the end. And the only way to reach that for me is for us to have all of our preconceived ideas and to have really robust conversations about them and come up with something that like on our own, none of us would have came up with or maybe had the courage to even say. Uh, so to me, it's just like, you know, it's what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I appreciate yeah. all the kind words. Here's a question that I get asked a lot. And for me, the answer is Lionel or Sam. It's like an answer that like living in Google, it's like the first thing that'll come up. But I'm gonna ask it to you guys. Uh, this one's coming from Sarah Rinert. Uh, do you have a character that you identify most with and um, how do you go about writing characters that you don't connect with as much? I'm just gonna go this way on my square, which is Chuck. Oh, great. Um, well, it's, yeah, Lionel is sort of my default as well. And I, I thought when I got hired on the show, I was gonna be writing a bunch of Lionel episodes. And I ended up writing a lot of Troy episodes. And I realized, oh shit, my bosses are smarter than I am. <laughs> Cause like they, they assigned to me the person whose voice they knew I would get. and like and Kurt the same way. Like I didn't think I'd be able to write Kurt as well, 
But I, uh, first of all, Wyatt, uh, who plays the, who plays Kurt, is, is so good. It's like easy to write for him. And Brandon, who plays Troy, like just getting those two together on stage was like, I, I don't know. For me, it, it, it made the inner those people come out in me, which I thought. Uh, so they're probably the ones I connect with the most. That's great. Steven? I think if you don't identify with a character, first of all, I, I think it's funny because like my episode on season three was a Lionel episode and then my episode on season four was a Troy episode. So like there's like a precedent from removing from like Lionel to Troy. But I think, um, I think if you don't identify with a character, you find something to love about them. You find something to identify with them. Mm -hmm. um, like for me, I mean, for Lionel, so I wrote the orgy uh, episode in season seven, uh, season seven, episode seven, season three, and, you know, it was easy to identify with Lionel as a queer man who's not comfortable in his own skin, because I feel like a lot of queer people aren't comfortable in their own skin. Um, his trepidation with going to an orgy, I certainly have one, but like, <laughs> I have trepidation about that. But uh, in terms of like writing Troy, I also relate to like Troy's um alphaness trying to like get things done be in charge and so like even though like i don't ready i readily identify with him i just found something with him to connect with and then next person on my screen is jack um i feel like resident reader of all the white people when we do table reads <laughs> <laughs> but weirdly uh i actually feel maybe not weirdly but i feel like deontay is the character i relate most closely to. I think his expression of, I don't know, I, I just feel like his, the expression, his expression of sexuality and whatever is, is, is not dissimilar to my own. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely think Coco is the character I relate, the, or I, I struggle the most with. Um, but I, that said, I also think, like Stephen said, I think you do try to find the thing that, find the kind of keystone that connects you to somebody. And I think for her, for me with her, it's, it's like imposter syndrome. Like mm -hmm. that's the thing that like, I'm like, okay, if I start from there, like the rest becomes clear to me. Um, yeah. Nasty. Um, well, I, you know, I really like writing for Sam and, uh, you know, the funny thing is the first season, um, you know, I was doing more like the back end stories so I, I ended up doing episode eight because we were going to lose some writers and it was like oh well who's going to be around okay i'm going to do one of the later episodes and i remember getting a lionel episode and i have to tell you honestly i was like a little scared i was like okay i'm like a middle-aged mom i'm gonna write that <laughs> the single perspective of 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 like the gay guy and i thought like we are gonna have like we're you know we're gonna have like a great room and we're gonna put it together and we're gonna have a good story but still like how do i do this and i honestly the that whole episode i wrote from the point of view of i came what to the states when i was really young i was an immigrant and i was an outsider and i always felt like i didn't fit in i didn't fit in i mean i still have that in me to some degree but I like tapped into what it felt like when I was 12 and I was an immigrant from Iran, you know? And I was like, that's how he feels. And he has that moment where he's all of a sudden in this place and he's feeling good about himself and he starts dancing. That was an idea that you had, Justin, from the very beginning, is you just saw him in this like, in this environment where he was dancing and he was feeling free. And I was like, like I remembered that moment happening for me in college where I felt like that. That's what I tried to tap into. Cause I was just like, okay, this is not me at all. How do I tap into this? Okay, he's the, he's the awkward immigrant, <laughs> you know? That's how I'm gonna, that's how I'm gonna do it. So. I love that. And Jerry, what about you? Well, it's interesting because I, first season, I was a little slow on the uptake because first and second season, I was like, why do I keep getting the Coco episodes? But then it dawned on me, I was like, oh, so they think that I'm like this shade throwing. No! <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I was huh? like, oh my God, they think I'm this evil. <laughs> 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But I did find that like the more I wrote her, I saw my some elements of her and myself. <laughs> 
First of all, can I just say, we <laughs> love Coco, and Coco is one of our, our most popular characters. Absolutely. Oh, I, I love her as a character. I just don't relate to her as much. <laughs> no, well, we it's a good thing and Jerry was here. <laughs> <laughs> That's why no, I got her throwing. in the third season, because it was shade throwing. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's so, true. Coco Wait, what were you saying, in Jerry? I interrupted you. But it's, you know, at first I didn't really see the connection, and it kind of dawned on me the more the character was developing, the more I got to know her. And I think um, part of what I, did, I identify um, with her about is sort of like having that, um, that tension between like her real self and the self that she presents. And I guess that's every character's dilemma, but I think it's more articulated in Coco. Um, and yeah, I throw some shade, I can do that. You know, shame in my game. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but then I also a little bit, um, sort of like to Steven's point, finding something you can relate to with all the characters. Um, you know, maybe I identify with a little bit of um, Sam's anger. I'm just gonna put mm -hmm. that out there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, can I can I add to that? I'm sorry. One thing I forgot to mention before, yeah. as far as like writing something you don't connect with necessarily. What I try to do in my personal life is like if I'm having a fight with somebody, I try to imagine how would that person describe this fight to another friend of theirs. And so mm -hmm. that's sort of that's sort of how it helps me to sort of mm -hmm. see in the person's perspective. And so I guess to translate that into writing, it's like well, if this person were the star of their own show where they got the authority to write their own voice, how would they? perceive or how would they uh, project this this fight or this experience or this emotion and and go to it from there that's great there that's are cool. there are so many fantastic questions that we do not have time to answer i'm a little <laughs> devastated because they're real good maybe we have time for one more is someone going to turn this off i don't know how this works <laughs> um let's see <laughs> one one yes. one okay um, okay, so this is, I think this is actually a really great question to close out on. There are so many great questions. Thank you guys for asking them. Um, but this one is going to be from Janelle Burke, who says, thank you guys. As a new writer, every pilot you write comes a little closer to your core. How do you balance humor drama with that scary nakedness? Hmm. Uh, I think I hide behind the humor. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I use the humor to, like, sort of, like, make the nakedness more comfortable for me, I guess. Mm. Um, I, I think for our show, we try to get into the muck. We try to like, the hu the nakedness provides the humor. <laughs> and, and like, you know, when we have Lionel like sniffing undies and stuff like that, you know, that is, that is, that is Chuck specifically putting his undies. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was me. I will, I will take ownership. First sexual <laughs> uh, deviancy into the character. Uh, but we try to make it, you know, human on the show anyway. Yeah, uh, it's, it, it is, oh, I'm sorry. No, go for it, Chuck, go for it, Chuck. Oh, it, is, it is stuff like that that you, that, that it's like an idea and in another room, in another writer's room, you might feel like, God, that's probably not the appropriate thing to say. Maybe that's a little too personal. There was no line like that in Dear White People. So it was like, whatever the fuck you've experienced or like your deepest, like craziest, whatever fantasy or whatever it is or, or experience. And I've had a lot of experience crushing on straight guys so that that Lionel thing was was very real to me um but like it, it you're we were encouraged to go like he said into the muck and just like not hold anything back judgment free zone we learned a lot about each other we learned a lot about ourselves and it was like therapy that paid you <laughs> yeah that's such a good way to it. I, I just want to say John Burke is a great writer um I actually just read one of her scripts today um the girl who asked this question um oh. so first off. But secondly, I think that is true. Um, going towards the scared nakedness is almost always the right choice, as scary as it is. Like, it, the more honest and more open you can be in your work, uh, it just feels more vital. And I think we all have had experience on shows that don't feel like they go there. Um, and, and as a result, kind of feel... Um, like samey, <laughs> like that's not a word, but like they just feel like a little bit like, oh, it's it's a paint by numbers TV show or whatever, where it's like, this is the type of episode where this happens and blah, blah, and we've all sort of seen that. And I think what makes Dear White People different and what makes I think the best kind of writing that we've all done independently different is when you write the thing that you're like, am I crazy? Like, is this nuts? 
and then people read it and they're like, oh my God, either I have always thought this and never said it or, oh my God, that's crazy. I can't believe you did it, but it was so compelling because I had never thought of it. Like, I, I think that going towards the scary is good. Well, guys, thank you so much for this time. We're all out of it. <laughs> But if you enjoyed this conversation, you know, nominate us for an Emmy or something. I don't know. Maybe we can keep having them. <laughs> um, thank you so much to the Writers Guild Foundation uh, and to my wonderful, wonderful uh, writers, um, some of whom couldn't be here, but I'm so glad you guys could be here. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you for season four as soon as we can legally shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye, Bye, thank you. Thanks, thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>